The Laws of Quarantine, published by PocketCollege.com. IBL 06, Sixth Commandment. Professor, Dr. R.J. Rushduni. Subject, Prerequisite, Law. Genre, Speech. Track, 47. Dictation name, RR130Z47. Location, Venue. Year, 1960s to 1970s. Numbers Chapter 5 Verses 1 to 4. The Quarantine or Segregation Laws. Numbers Chapter 5 Verses 1 to 4. 5 And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, to command the children of Israel, that they put out of the camp every leper, and every one that hath an issue, and whosoever is defiled by the dead. Three both male and female shall ye put out, without the camp shall ye put them, that they defile not their camps, in the midst whereof I dwell. Four and the children of Israel did so, and put them out without the camp, as the Lord spake unto Moses, so did the children of Israel. The sixth commandment thou shalt not kill has as its implication the preservation and furthering of life within the framework of God's law. And basic to this task of preservation are the laws of quarantine, these laws take up a great many chapters of the Mosaic Law. And the passage we just read is just a brief summary of one aspect of these laws. Leviticus chapter 13, 14, and 15, three very long chapters give many specific details of these laws as do passages in Exodus and a couple chapters as well in Deuteronomy. It is important to understand the significance of these chapters. The details of these quarantine or segregation laws are not now applicable because they refer to conditions that have changed, but the principles are still valid. Before we analyze these laws it is important to call attention to the fact that words sometimes have varying meanings and the word leprosy appears repeatedly in these chapters. It means one thing to us, when we think of the word leprosy we think of Hansen's disease. The Bible however, as Dr. A. Randall Short, a British surgeon has pointed out in a study of these laws, uses the term leprosy as a general term for a variety of contagious and highly infectious diseases so that very often in the chapters the word plague is also used, and other general terms as equivalent to the term leprosy. Thus, the word has a broader application than what we think of as being leprosy or Hansen's disease. These laws, incidentally, helped eradicate leprosy or Hansen's disease to a great extent in Europe because as they were applied in the Middle Ages they worked together with other measures to reduce it to the vanishing point, virtually. Now, the laws in Leviticus chapter 13, 14, and 15 in particular are of two varieties. Those dealing with a variety of plagues and infectious diseases in Leviticus chapter 13 verse 1 15 15 and those dealing with sex in chapter 15 16 33. Incidentally, the number of laws dealing with sex as we will deal with relation to the seventh commandment do prohibit among other things the association of sex with worship. Now for us this is perhaps a remote problem, but this was in those days a very very lively problem because in antiquity the fertility cult which prevailed throughout the world made acts of sex basic to worship so that attendance at the temple involved ritual prostitution for both male and female and a variety of acts of perversion. About 20 years ago, a little more in fact, I called attention at a church meeting to the fact that this association was due to rise again. That everything pointed to the revival of sex as central to religious worship. I did so when I read the work of a prominent theologian Robert Harold Bondius who wrote and I quote, The act of intercourse is itself a disturbed as an outward and visible symbol of communion, not merely between man and wife, but with God. Unquote. This from a book Christian Paths the Self-Acceptance, published in 1948 and clearly this element has become prominent in the life of the churches today. Sex is closely linked with revolution. To return to the laws of quarantine these laws cover diseases, the handling of the dead, epidemics, plagues, and the likes. But the laws have implications beyond the realm of physical diseases and the variety of statements embedded in these quarantine laws make it clear that even as physical contagion must be avoided and steps taken to that end so likewise more, contagion and contamination must be avoided. Leviticus chapter 18 verses 1 to 5 and verse 24 to 30 and Leviticus chapter 20 verses 22 to 24 these statements are made and God in the latter passage Leviticus chapter 20 verses 22 to 24 identifies himself as the God who separates his people from other people as a part of their salvation so that God calls his people apart he segregates them in order that he might further their preservation and their salvation separation or segregation quarantine is thus a basic principle of biblical law not only with respect to plagues and contagious diseases but with respect to religion and morality. Every attempt to destroy this principle is an effort to reduce society to the lowest common denominator. The word toleration of course is greatly used in our day as an excuse. The concept of toleration usually conceals a radical intolerance.
As Christians we believe in grace and in charity towards all people, but toleration embodies another principle. That of relativism. What the doctrine of toleration as it is commonly taught involves is, a relativism that says we must not make any difference between the criminal and the law-abiding Christian, between the pervert and the morally sound man, between the believer and the unbeliever, that all must be put on the same level. In actuality, however, that doctrine of toleration conceals a radical intolerance. In the name of tolerance, the believer is apt to tolerate everything because the unbeliever tolerates nothing. It means life on the enemy's terms. Biblical law is in effect denied the right to exist. Because all things in terms of this modern doctrine of toleration must be leveled downwards, and we can have no standards. We must be totally tolerant. An example of this kind of intolerance in the name of tolerance appeared in the papers recently and of course you can find one almost every week. This from the Ann Landers. Column and I quote, Dear Ann Landers, why do you pin orchids on the virgins without knowing the facts? If you could see some of those white flowered girls you'd know they couldn't give it away. Why not use your valuable newspaper to praise the sought after sexy girl who is constantly chased by men and is sometimes caught? I'm a woman in my mid-forties who has worked ten years with young girls and a of fools. I see the goody-goody types in their little white shirts, white shirt waist blouses and oxfords, so smug and proud of their chastity, as if they had a choice. They make me sick. Only last Friday that darling little redhead, just 21, sobbed out her story in the ladies' room. Lucy had been jilted by an executive after six months of steady courtship. They had been intimate and she was counting on marriage. It was the fourth time she'd had this terrible thing happen to her. Those like Lucy need Ann Landers to tell them they aren't all bad, to give them encouragement not a put down. I've been reading your silly column for 12 years and I think you are a perfect fool. Mama Leom. Dear Mama, thanks for the compliment that nobody's perfect. I don't happen to have any good conduct medals lying around for girls who think the bedroom is a shortcut to the altar. Moreover, a girl who makes the mistake four times is what I call, in polite language, a non-learner. Unquote. Now this letter clearly reveals a bitter hatred of virtue together with a strong sympathy for the promiscuous girl who was seen as the finer person. Emphatically so. There is no tolerance in this letter, only a cited intolerance. And this is the order of the day, those who demand tolerance are really among the most intolerant of people. We do not as Christians believe in tolerating evil, we do not believe in tolerating assaults on decency. We do believe in Christian grace and charity, which recognizes that their differences and then moves with the grace of God as well as the law of God in terms of the situation. The basic premise of the modern doctrine of toleration is that all religious and moral positions are equally true and equally false. It is a radical relativism and humanism. We are asked to treat the Muslim as though Islam were as true as biblical faith. To treat the cannibal as though his practices are as valid morally as ours. This is not only the implicit claim but it has been explicitly stated by a number of writers. The premise of their argument is since there is no proof, how dare anyone place his truth above the others. So that, the cannibal is morally as fine a person in his standards as the Christian is in his. In other words there is no particular truth or moral value to any religion. Now these people of course when they are trying to make you destroy your doctrine of truth, your absolutes, have always a hidden absolute, and their absolute is man. Since man is his own ultimate, man is his own god, there can be no law, no standard over man whereby men are to be judged. And this of course is precisely the purpose of the modern revolutionary activities. One of the leaders of the Yippies who was most active in Chicago and is president under indictment stated that the outsider failed to understand the significance of the use of narcotics, of LSB and other narcotics in the present revolution. Their purpose, he said, is to destroy all senseless discrimination of distinction of moral values, and the purpose of dirt on their part is the same. And they just realized that we cannot use standards to evaluate people. Because man is the only value, and therefore all men are of equal value. They do thus have a standard, an absolute man, and in terms of this man they are savagely intolerant of our doctrine of truth. Thus the true value of being man himself, man must be granted total acceptance, irrespective of his character. This of course is not a new doctrine, it has been developing since the beginning of the Enlightenment. It gained particularly vocal attention's expression in this country and Walt Whitman, who has dedicated himself to proclaiming this doctrine. In his form to a common prostitute of course he made this point emphatically, declaring not until the sun excludes you do I exclude you. In fact, in a number of other forums he made it clear that such a person, the pervert, the prostitute, and others, were superior because they did not have religious and moral standards. 
total acceptance, total integration is demanded by relativistic humanism and this is clearly radically anti-Christian. It places man in God's stead and in the name of toleration and equality relegates Christianity to the dump heap. This doctrine unfortunately is preached all too often in the churches. In the past week, one document that came across my desk was the Fuller Seminary Theology News and Notes with an article in it that the suffering body by Louis B. Smeads, who teaches at Calvin College and Seminary in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And the whole point of his thesis, of course, is quite close to the death of God's school of thinking. He identifies God wholly with man, and as he interprets the Incarnation, he says, let us say God and ghettoed himself. Now this is the meaning of the Incarnation, the end ghettoizing of God. So that if we want to look for the Incarnation, we must look the ghetto. If we want to find Christ, we want to find him in man, in the ghetto. Integration and equality are myths. The disguise simply a new segregation and a new inequality. Mama Laom's letter which I read makes clear that promiscuity is for her superior to virginity and chastity. And with her there is clearly a new segregation. Virtue is subjected to hostility and scorn and it is separated in the effect for destroying it. Social order inescapably institutes its own program for separation and segregation. A particular faith and morality is given privileged status and all else is separated for a progressive elimination. Every law order, which every society has, shows that certain things are good and certain things are bad, so that it involves a fundamental segregation. Every law order says there is a criminal class, and a good class. The criminal class may be the murder, the thief, and the pervert, or it may be the counselist, it may be the man who believes in free enterprise, or unsocialized medicine and unsocialized dentistry. But every law order institutes a form of segregation. It uses equality and integration as a pretext to subvert the older or existing form of social order. For example, the communists, in the name of ending all segregation and all inequality, worked for the revolution, promised the peasants that the palaces would be there, that they would all live in palaces. All men would have the same income, and then when the revolution was over, of course promptly instituted radical inequality and segregation that Russia had ever seen. One observer in the 20s during the days of the famine in talking to the people of Russia during the Hoover relief was told by some of them that they deserved what they were getting because they had listened to this talk about equality and had been ready to plunder and to kill, figuring that when they drove off the inhabitants of the palaces and the good homes they would become the possessors of them and they would have the equivalent. But they ended up in greater poverty. Every society has its laws of separation, segregation, in terms of what constitutes for it good and what constitutes for evil. Education, of course, is a form of segregation and a basic instrument thereof. Certain aspects of life and experience are given priority as truth, and others are relegated to a position of unimportance or classed as wrong. Education, because it passes or fails, is inescapably given to inequality and segregation. It classifies all creation in terms of certain standards. When the state takes over control of education, it then begins to reorder in terms of its standards. It denies to people the right to maintain their own private schools. This happens in countries that turn socialist so that only the state's principle of separation can exist. The state then excludes from the curriculum everything that points to the truth of biblical faith and establishes a new doctrine of truth. In the name of objective reason, it insists its highly subjective hostility till all its enemies be regarded as the new law of being. But the fact of quality, of course, is what we are saying segregates. The fact of the ability to work segregates. The existence of a home, or a house, segregates. The fact of family life segregates. Every family is a segregated institution, this is not my statement, this is the statement of James Grant, former president of Harvard, former high commissioner of Germany, prominent chemist, who said that as long as we are dedicated to the proposition that democracy and equality are desirable, the family is a roadblock to a realization of our institution. An Education in a Divided World, published in 48 by Harvard University of France, he stated that the family was dedicated to the principle of aristocracy. Because every family sought to do the best for his children, and it was thus an aristocratic institution. Alien to our democracy and therefore there was, he said, an inescapable conflict between the two. It doesn't take much guessing to find out which he feels must lose. The word segregation is a good word. It has been much abused. It has been abused by people who want to make color or race the only principle of segregation rather than a principle of truth, a principle of achievement. It has been abused by those who were trying to destroy our present law order and create a revolutionary law order. It is being used also by the United Nations which says there can no discrimination with respect to a variety of things such as race, color, or creed. So that all religions are in effect above it because they discriminate. 
They declare their position to be the truth. But the UN Charter when it makes the statement is informed by a radical humanism. So it replaces the old religion with the new religion, humanism. All religions segregate and humanism is no exception. Its order of truth becomes the principle of division of classification and of segregation. And it becomes most hostile and most discriminatory, it segregates most radically because it insists on total control of all institutions and denies the liberty of other orders of truth, of other doctrines who establish their own communities, their own way of life. The biblical law then is a principle of segregation. It is the only valid principle because it strikes both against the humanistic totalitarian, it strikes against the racists who want to strike against an older humanistic and non-religious premise. It strikes against every order that places man above truth or makes one segment of mankind the order of truth. The commandment thou shalt not kill means therefore that we must segregate between truth and error, between the murderer and the godly man. Because, if we do not institute a principle of segregation between the two we destroy society. If the murderer is not dealt with the murderer will then take over society. If the thief is not prosecuted, if he is not segregated, if his way of life declared to be socially undesirable, legislated against, then we will have a society of thieves. St. Paul as he summarized the Old Testament laws of quarantine and its separation, declares in 2 N.D. Corinthians 6.17 that it could be summed up in a sentence. Come ye out from among them and be separated, thus saith the Lord. This then is the basic principle of progress. To draw a line of separation between good and evil. Between a learned man and an ignorant man. Between a thief and an honest man. Between a quack and a good practitioner. Between every kind of falsity and every form of truth. Come ye out from among them and be ye separate. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we give thanks unto thee that thou hast called us by thy grace to be a people unto thee. And we pray, our Father, that by thy grace we may... Quarantine and Community, published by PocketCollege.com. Deuteronomy. Professor, Dr. R. J. Rushduni. Subject, Pentateuch. Lesson, 83 to 110. Genre, Talk. Track, 83. Dictation name, rr 187883 Location, Venue. Year, 1993. Let us worship God. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, we give thanks unto thee that thy wisdom exceeds the understanding of men and thy righteousness, thy justice, surpasses all that man can conceive. We therefore commit ourselves unto thy hands, knowing that thy ways are altogether just and holy. That thy purposes are altogether good and thy purpose for us is our eternal glory in Christ Jesus. Give us faith so to walk day by day that in all things we are more than conquerors in Christ. In his name we pray, Amen. Our scripture is Deuteronomy chapter 24 verses 8 to 9. Our subject, Quarantine and Community. Deuteronomy chapter 24 verses 8 to 9. Take heed in the plague of leprosy, that thou observe diligently, and do according to all that the priests the Levites shall teach you, as I commanded them, so ye shall observe to do. 9. Remember what the Lord thy God did unto Miriam by the way, after that ye were come forth out of Egypt. Now this text is a very, very important one for our day. This text immediately concerns leprosy. The word as it is used in the Bible includes a variety of serious infections, one of which is the leprosy we know today. This leprosy called Hansen's disease was near the disappearing point before World War II, that is, here in the United States. Now especially with the influx of aliens from Southeast Asia it is emphatically on the rise. However, even as we as a nation have rejected the biblical requirement of quarantine for AIDS, so too we have abandoned it for leprosy, even though it is increasing. It is being caught by others than those from Southeast Asia. We shall before the morning is over I hope understand why, why we have done this. One commentator has observed of our text that primitive societies typically see disease as a religious matter. The question, however, is one of ultimacy. Today we are approaching a state of mind where virtually everything is a political rather than a religious matter. Can we honestly regard as primitive or backward those who view all things as essentially religious? 
Are not we equally superstitious or primitive if you want to use those terms if we view everything as political? It is an aspect of the stupidity of the modern mind that it sees nothing as wise except itself. This is provincialism of an amazing kind. This law is do others makes a quarantine mandatory. There always have been a tendency to relax the law where the wealthy and the powerful are concerned. God allows no such exemptions and we are reminded that not even Miriam, sister to Aaron and Moses, was spared. She had to be quarantined. More craft has pointed out and I quote, God identifies himself as the God who separates his people from other peoples. Therefore separation including Christian intolerance of other religions and gods is a basic principle of biblical law with respect to religion and morality. Unquote. More craft is very much to the point. When God separates us to himself more separation must follow. We then separate ourselves from evil, moral and physical evils. Quarantine thus is a logical consequence in the medical sphere. Being a Christian does not make us immune to being killed by a fire or from drowning. We avoid dangers instead of courting them and where God requires a separation we make it. Another commentator has said that this law has as its purpose increasing the priestly power. This he grounds on verse 8 where we are told, Do according to what the priests and levites shall teach you. All this passage does is to say that the priest had authority as public health officers, nothing more. The search for supposedly primitive motives and goals leads scholars to amazing absurdities. The basic meaning is very different. As Kyle Unknown ably commentated and I quote, The thought here therefore is be on thy guard because of the plague of leprosy, that is, that thou dost not get it, have to bear it. As the reward for thy rebellion against what the priests teach according to the commandment of the Lord, watch diligently that thou do not incur the plague of leprosy, the Vulgate reads, or unknown rendering, that thou do not sin that thou art punished with leprosy. Unquote. Leviticus chapters 13 to 14 give us the laws on leprosy. This text is a reminder of those laws and our summons to take heed unto them. It is a warning not to be overconfident that we will not acquire the contagion. Infections have more than a single and simple physical cause. They can have a moral cause. Miriam was stricken because of her rebellion. To assume that a naturalistic causality marks all things is false. After all, we do not respond physiologically to everything, our response is not simply physiological. Why should it be so in God's creation? If God is what he says he is, the maker of heaven and earth and all things therein, he is the ultimate cause of all things and can be an immediate cause. The fact that God ordains this law means that God is telling us our health is important. We cannot morally be justified if we abuse our bodies and play havoc with our health. From our Lord's words in Luke chapter 17 verse 14 we see this law was still enforced in our Lord's day and of course it was in medieval Europe and beyond. The priest had to pronounce a healed leper clean or there could be no return to normal life. It is absurd to state as some do that priests then functioned as doctors. There were physicians in both Old and New Testament eras but it was a religious requirement that quarantine be instituted and also ended by the priests. The fact had to be governed by moral and religious premises. Civil authorities then and now are governed by political considerations. And in the last quarter of the 20th century we have seen rules of quarantine set aside for political reasons. In the Bible however see Miriam and centuries later King Uzziah segregated from others because of their leprosy. This religious character of quarantine provided an additional although not infallible check against the political abuse of this law. There is another aspect to the biblical law of quarantine, namely, membership in the community is not a right, it is a privilege. If membership is a human right, then quarantine in any form of exclusion is morally wrong. Then too, excommunication becomes a violation of a right. There can be given the premise that membership in the community is a human right no exclusively male or female, Protestant or Catholic, white or any other kind of exclusive organization. Given the humanistic premise of human right we see the rise of legal bars against exclusionary rules. John Dewey saw in a common faith an anti-democratic and illegitimate character in biblical Christianity because of the division of people into the saved and the lost, the good and the evil. If we say that it is a human right that there be no division then ultimately we destroy all law. But if we operate in terms of God's law then we operate in terms of moral premises. It should not surprise us that quarantine laws have been dropped all over the world. If homosexuality and the AIDS disease are not grounds from barring people from society or from a job, or from serving food in a public eating place, then how can any form of separation or segregation in terms of faith and morality be maintained? In the history of Christendom the emphasis on community has at times been extended to the dead. An excommunicated man or a suicide, for example, could not be buried in a church graveyard, in hallowed grounds. 
This seems cruel and arbitrary to the modern man but it simply meant that the holy community was a very serious fact to its members. This fact of community has faded for us. At one time community had a momentous meaning. Monasticism was in medieval Europe held for centuries in very high esteem because the monks apart from the good they did in the way of charity, reclaiming deserts, building dikes and all, were highly regarded, something we forget today, because they prayed as representatives of the whole Christian community. If you were in a village near a monastery you knew that at all times, in some cases 24 hours a day, a group of monks were praying for the community. Whether it was in England or Austria or Armenia, wherever. Continuous prayer for the people of their community. Men outside the monastery knew that the monks were praying as their representatives. In the Book of Common Prayer we have a relic of this in both morning and evening prayer, a prayer for all conditions of men, a petition for the entire community. Because the community has been so important a fact over the centuries, excommunication or any form of ban was seen as a form of death. The community means life is against death. It is especially important that even the lepers of old upheld the community that barred them from membership. These lepers cried out to all who approached them, unclean, unclean. They thereby protected the community from themselves. It was God's community and the life of their loved ones who were healthy they felt they had to safeguard, so even the outcast lepers protected the community whose center was the sanctuary and the God of that sanctuary. If God be removed from this community there remains a collection of random persons, unconnected and without any overriding faith and loyalty. The lepers of old who cried, unclean, had a greater sense of community than the godless men of our time. It should be apparent now how much modern culture has stripped man of community and of meaning. Confronted by a simple rule that indicates the implications of community and of separation or segregation, men see this as an obsolete rule of quarantine and valid no more. We are morally and intellectually self-impoverished. A further implication, we have had a form of quarantine in the imprisonment of guilty men. The evidence indicates that this too is breaking down under the influence of humanistic equalitarianism. We have an attorney general of the U.S. who has said it is her duty to protect the guilty. John Dewey's demand for the destruction of all divisiveness in society is in process of following its inner logic. If there be no good nor evil, if we are to live in a world stripped of all moral discrimination why have courts? Why have prisons? This is a question which many humanists are raising. They are for the abolition of all discrimination and they see courts and prisons as a watered-down form of heaven and hell, of biblical discrimination. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank Thee that Thy word recalls us to moral health, to justice and to truth. Grant that in a time when men are seeking to destroy all boundary marks that we affirm not the ungodly boundary marks of men or the ungodly destruction of all boundary marks, but Thy word, Thy division between good and evil, right and wrong. Grant us this we beseech Thee in Christ's name, Amen.